The topic today I'm talking about is finishing well. And naturally, when we think about the subject of finishing well, we'll think about the finishing line. So the question for you and I is that, is this the finishing line? Or is there something more? So for me, I, I have this morbid hobbit. I like to read what is on the inscription on the tombstone. I like to read Epitaph. Uh, Hepi- Epita. And uh, this is one of my favorite epitaphs that I, I have found. Remember, friend, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you will surely be. Prepare thyself to follow me. So I said, oh. <laughs> now, as in all things, you should have some smart aleck who have put PS. And this is what the PS says, all right? Follow you, I won't be content until I know which way you went. <laughs> now, we all like to know which way you went before we follow because we want to make sure that you finish well, we follow, right? Now, the question you and I have to ask is that what defines finishing well? How do you define finishing well? Right, I'd like us to know that as on the onset, right, finishing well has nothing to do with your happiness, nor your uh, health, nor your wealth. Happiness, uh, finishing well has nothing to do with your physical accomplishments. Nothing. Because finishing well has everything to do with God. Because God is the judge of all things. At the end of our life, it is the law that will decide whether we finish well or not. And therefore, it's important for you and I to go back to the scripture and see how God defines finishing well. All right, so we have come to this uh, verse that uh, you have recited earlier. And it gives us a glimpse of how finishing well will look like. And before I go further, let's pray and ask God to unpack this for us. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here with us and you are here to illuminate the word of God to us. And we pray this day, Lord, that remove the distractions of our mind and give us the revelation of the Spirit to help us to, to see your truth, to understand your truth so that your truth can set us free from the distraction of this world to pursue you to the very end that we may all finish well for the glory of God. I mean, it's time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we know that this is a very common verse. Many homes uh, have this verse in their wall. All right, we also say, uh, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The question is that, how does that look like? What does it really mean when you say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord? Does it mean something like this? All right? Uh, by the way, that's my family, my, my wife, my son, my daughter, okay? So does it mean that a happy family going out to minister to the people, serve the Lord by doing things together? Does it mean that? It, it does include that. But I want you to know that when the verse says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, it means more than that. It means more than a happy family serving God together. And in order for you and I to know more what does it really mean, we need to go to the context of Joshua 24. Right? The Joshua 24, the context is this. It's the words of a of dying man. Joshua is dying and he is gathering the people to give his final word. And because it is his final word, it's www. What does that stand for? Won't waste word lah. All right, because it's his dying breath. He's going to tell us something and therefore, he won't waste word. And he spent the entire chapter 24 to unpack for us how good God has been to the people of God and he's telling them that they need to choose God to finish well. All right? Now, this is just the outline. Don't worry. I just want to quickly show you the outline. The outline is that he spent 28 verses talking about how good God is and how then should we respond. And he ended up with two parts. Where the first part talked about the death of Joshua, death of Eliezer, and then finally talks about Joseph Bones. All right, I will end off by talking about these three things, uh, the, the death and the displacement. But I want to spend the last part talking about the first part. All right? Now, this is not for you to read. This is just to show you uh, the flow from verse 3 to verse 13. Verse 3 to verse 13, what uh, Joshua did was he was recounting for the people of God how, how good God has been to all of them. All right, you go all the way to the days of Abraham and he said this. This is what God said. God said, I have took your father Abraham 
beyond the river and I led him into the land of Canaan. I've multiplied his descendants. All right? I, gave to, I, uh, I gave to Isaac and I gave to Esau. Then you move on to talk about the life of Moses. He says that I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt so that I can bring you out of Egypt. All right? I put darkness between you and, and the Egyptians. I brought you into the land of the Amorites. Uh, I gave them into your hand and I destroyed their enemies. Then it goes on to the time of Joshua. He says that as you enter in, this is what I've done for you. I give the enemies to you. I send hornets ahead of you and I've given you land on which you have not labored, cities which you have not built. Now, in the, what Joshua was doing was he spent 13 verses trying to paint to the people of God that God has been good to you. 17, he listed at least 17 things that God has done for the children of Israel. And it is in the light of what God has done, he asked this most important question. All right, he says that in verse 14, now therefore, the therefore referred to the first 13 verses. Therefore, in the light of all that God has done, he issued this question to the people. Choose for yourself today. Who would you serve? God has been good to us. But today you have to decide who would you choose? Would you serve? Choosing is a very important thing because finishing well is really about choosing well. You see, life is a series of choice. Life is a series of decision making. Finishing well is the result of making the right choice. Your destiny, my destiny, is completely tied to the choice we made. Now, choice making, decision making, choosing is so important that in the first five books of the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses actually emphasized that, that we need to choose well. All right, just to show you, uh, this is the last sermon of Moses to the people of God. In the last sermon in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, Moses said this I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life in order that you may live. Many of you think common sense, or between life and death, what do you choose? Choose life. Lah. But you must understand when you say choose life, you must understand the meaning of that, not from the way you understand it. Because as far as Moses is concerned, when you say you choose life, this is what you choose. You love God, obey God, and hold fast to God. When the scripture says choose life, it means that you will love God, obey God, and hold on to God. That's what it means. And it's important that you choose right. You choose life. It's so important that it's repeated in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 8, right, after the, the conquest at Ai, as they enter into the promised land, this is what Joshua did. Joshua divided the people. One group, they stay at Mount Gerizim. One group at Mount Ebal. And right in the middle, in verse 34, this is what he did. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, meaning the whole five books of the Bible, including Deuteronomy. <clears throat> the blessing and the curse. All right, obviously referring to Deuteronomy. According to all that's written in the book of the law, verse 35, there was not a word of all that the Moses have commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who lived among them. All right? It was so important is the word that Moses actually have the people of God listen throughout all the word of God, which include choosing life. And then we come to the last part of his life, chapter 24. The last part of Joshua's life, he repeated it again. Right, I just want to paint for you the, the linkages so that you can see that this is consistent. <clears throat> for you and I to finish well, we need to choose well. We need to choose to serve the Lord. In chapter 24, the word serve the Lord is repeated 11 times. All right, just in one chapter, 11 times, serve the Lord. You don't have to be a very smart Bible student to know that serving the Lord is the main idea. All right, in chapter 24, serve the Lord is the main idea. So in order for you and I to finish well, 
we must choose to serve the Lord. We must choose to serve the Lord. Now you may think, how? How to do that? I'd like to unpack this for us. There are at least three things from this whole text. Three things about our choice. When you say you choose to serve the Lord, there are three things. Your choice must be complete, your choice must be consistent, and your choice must be carried out. All right, now before I go further, some of you may think in your head, does that mean that all of us must serve God full time? All right? So the question is, must we all serve God full time? This is yes, this is no, this is both up. <laughs> all right, so what's the answer? Uh, does that mean that all of us must serve God full time? What's yes or no? Yes, of course. Any part time Christian here? Even you have, you're also Pisces to admit, right? There's no such thing as part time Christian. We are all called to serve the Lord full time. Just as some of you are paid by your company, some of you are paid by MOE, some of you are paid by the bank that you work for, some of you are paid by your own business. I happen to be paid by this company called BBTC. But we are all called to serve the Lord full time. Oh, you look so sad. Eh? <laughs> what a privilege. We are all called to serve the Lord full time. All right? Just say we are all paid differently. So tell me, I heard that when you smile, you produce healthy endorphins. So you smile, tell the person beside you, you are called to serve God full time. All right? How you and I can finish well? We can only finish well if we choose to serve the Lord all the way. Now, in order for us, to, we need to know the quality of this choice. The choice, first and foremost, must be complete. All right, so Joshua unpacked that for us. He says, verse 14, Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him, and put away the gods which your father served beyond the rivers. All right, so that is what it means by complete. When you say your decision is complete, your choice is complete, you must have these three things. You must fear God, serve God, and put away other gods. All right, so let me unpack quickly for you. Fear the Lord. This way, English is not adequate to define that for us. All right, when you say fear the Lord, it does not mean to be afraid of God. It doesn't mean that. What it does mean is this. It means that you love God so much, you, want to, you honor the Lord, and you don't want to do anything to break His heart. That's what fear the Lord means. That you have such honor to God that you don't want to hurt Him, you don't want to disgrace Him, so to speak. All right, that's what I mean by fear the Lord. That's why the Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You see, if you fear the Lord, you will have the wisdom of God and certainly you will be able to finish well. All right, we need the fear of God. Not only do you need the fear of God, you need to serve Him in sincerity and truth. Where does the word sincerity come from? It comes from the word sincere. Lah. Now, where does the word sincere come from? A dictionary is so clever. Okay. Now, the word sincere in its original meaning, I, I really don't mind that. I like interactive uh, audience. The word sincere comes from the word in, in the olden days uh, to talk about the word no, uh, sorry, no wax, without wax. Right? The word sincere means without wax. What happened was in the marketplace in the olden days when they are selling the pot, right? and then in the movement of the pot, sometimes the pot cracked. So what they did was they would melt the wax, fill out the crack, they polish it so that it looked as if it's faultless. But actually it has wax. So when you say your product is sincere, what you're really saying is that your product is without crack or without wax. Your, your product is good, your, good, your product is real, your product is authentic. And therefore it says serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. It means serve the Lord authentically. Serve the Lord sincerely. Serve the Lord truthfully. All right? You serve the Lord not because Pastor Singh Lee is watching. You know like the blessing campaign? You, you, you do the blessing can be because you need to give a report because senior pastor is checking. Right? That is not sincere. You are doing our compulsion. Right? You serve the Lord in, in sincerity and truth means that you do it because there's something within you that is real and you're doing it not because of someone to see. You do it from your heart. All right? So you've, we say, I choose to serve the Lord. You must fear God and you must serve Him in sincerity and truth. They say, put a Put away the gods. Now this part shocked me. It means this. It means that it is possible for you and I to fear God, to serve God sincerely, 
and still have other gods in your heart. Hear this again. It is possible for us to say that we fear God, we serve God in sincerity, and you still have gods in your heart. And that's why, now, the gods here, we are not referring to just the wooden images that people pray to. All right? The gods here refer to anything that you put your confidence in more than God. It can be your bank account, it can be your work, work, it can be your relationship, it can be anything that you rely on more than God Himself. That's idols. Right? So in order for you and I to serve the Lord, uh, to, when we say we choose to serve the Lord, our choice must be complete. And complete means fear God, serve God, and no other gods. All right? So that's what it means by completeness. When you say, I make this choice, my choice is complete. It is what it means. Fear God, serve God, no other gods. Let me illustrate this with this quick illustration. Imagine I invited uh, Brother Jeff to my house for dinner. I cook a good dish for him. And this is a very well done dish. Except one thing. I, I pick up this poisonous mushroom. I slice it and I put it inside. And I serve it to you. And you know it's poisonous. Would you eat it? No. Of course not. Brother Jeff is a smart guy, okay? Now, if, you, if we know that he would not accept this because this dish is not completely clean, why do you think that God would accept our incomplete worship? On one hand, we are reaching out to God. On the other hand, we are holding on to the devil. And, and, and you expect God to accept our worship? Right? It's, it's, it's like... In human term, it's like you're holding on to the hands of your wife at the same time you're holding on to the hand of your ex-girlfriend. You're asking for trouble. In the same way, when you talk about you serve the Lord, our choice to serve the Lord must be complete. God and God alone. All right, we cannot have other gods with us. We must serve God with a, a sincere heart. We must serve God with the fear of God. All right? So first of all, how can you and I finish well? We can only finish well if we choose to serve the Lord and our choice must be complete. Now, it's not good enough to be complete. It must be consistently live out. All right, it's one thing to say that my choice to serve the Lord is complete. All right, but you must live it out consistently and guard your heart against any idolatry. Because Joshua unpacked that further for us. He, he said to the people, you will not be able to serve the Lord. Now, this part is very interesting because earlier he says, uh, therefore, serve the Lord. And then he repeats again, serve the Lord. And then the people reply, yes, sir, we will serve the Lord. And you know what he said? In modern day English, this is what he said. But then you cannot make it. <laughs> this is exactly what he said. He said that you will not be able to serve the Lord. Why did he say that? He said that because he was questioning their sincerity. And it was important to question their sincerity because he wanted to unpack for them who God is. Who is this God? He is a holy God. He talks about this God is a holy God. He is, he is a cut above the rest. He's being set apart. This God is a God that cannot be stained by sin. He's a holy God. And not only is a holy God, He is a jealous God. Now, I learned recently that one of the ways to learn uh, uh, well, to have clarity is to have contrast. So when you think about the word jealousy, what's the one good word to contrast with jealousy? It's called envy. All right? Now, what does envy mean? Envy means that you want something badly, but it's not yours. What's jealousy? Jealousy is wanting something badly that is already yours. You get the picture? Right? They will say that God is a jealous God is because we are already His. We belong to Him. And God is jealous about us. All right? Now, He's not like the jealous boyfriend, jealous girlfriend. God, when you say God is a jealous God because God loves us so much, He's 100% committed to us. Not only that, He knows very well that He's the best God for us. There's no one else can love us better than God. And God is jealous about it because he loves us passionately and He knows that He is the best God for us. Now, let me pause and ask you the question. What is the greatest sin? We know the greatest commandment. We know the, greatest, the great commission. What is the greatest sin? 
the greatest sin is to break the greatest commandment. When God tells you this is the most important commandment and you willingly choose, uh, willfully break it, you have broke the greatest command. Uh, you have committed the greatest sin. Alright? Because, hey, what is the greatest command? What is the greatest command? To love your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your mind. Alright? God wants us to love Him back. And therefore, I think the warning that God is giving to the people of God is don't be flippant in our worship. All right? He warned them that He's a jealous God and He will not forgive your transgression. All right? So some of you may say, but, but I, uh, 1 John 1 9 tells us that God will forgive us. Yes, but, but Joshua is trying to tell them that there will be consequences to idolatry. All right? so if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after He's done good to you. All right? He's trying to warn us that there are consequences to idolatry. All right? There are consequences when we are inconsistent. So let me just paint for you quickly the consequences. You know, immediately after the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua ended on chapter 24. What happened after that? Chronologically. Immediately after the book of Joshua, you get the book of Judges. All right? So chronologically, immediately after that, what happened to the people of God? All right? So chapter 2 tells us that when, when Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, then verse 10, all the generation were also gathered to their fathers. All right? And then arose another generation who did not know the Lord, and yet the works which he had done for Israel. Nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then he went on to tell us, verse 11, the son of Israel did evil in the sight of God and served Baal. Go all the way down, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, before we judge this new generation, let's pull back a bit. Let's look at what happened to them. They did not know the Lord, and they, nor yet the work which He had done for Israel. So what does that tell us? They tell, basically, it tells us that the preceding generation, the generation of jo Joshua and the rest of the elders, they did not tell this new generation the works that God has done for them. Pause. Let me just try to explain it to you. Can you imagine they went through Jordan River, Jordan River dried up, they entered into the promised land, they conquered uh, Jericho and all that, all the mighty things that God has done through them and they did not tell their children. Can you believe that? That's what happened. What, that's, that described what the preceding generation, they did not tell the, the, the generation to come. Oh, may God forbid that this will happen to us in BBTC. That all of us here will tell of the goodness of the Lord to the future generation. Right? Now, see, because of that, right? Because of, they failed. Because they, their walk with God was not consistent. Because they were idols in their heart. The future generation paid the price. Right? It basically tells us that after that, for seven cycles, all right, they, they basically went through sinning, judgment, repentance. And, and seven times it recorded for us, the son of Israel again did evil in the sight of God. And, and towards the end of the book of Judges, it says that in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. As a result of the preceding generation that failed, and they failed because their walk with God was not consistent, because there were idols in their hearts. I want to tell you another story. And this story is taken from the Bible as well just to show you that men in, our, in hum, our human form we have such propensity to be inconsistent. Right, this man is King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, by all accounts, is a good king. Right, you, if you know of any Israeli uh, Jewish friend and all that, they have high regard for King Hezekiah. Today you go to Israel, there's this tunnel called Hezekiah Tunnel. Right? Great king who did wonders. All right? So he removed all the high places, the sacred stone, he cut down the Assyrian post, he broke, he broke the bronze serpent, he did right in the eyes of the Lord, and he was able to take back some of the lost territory. He restored the Passover. Basically what it tells us is that he's a good king. He restored worship. He reminded the people of what God has done. By all accounts, wonderful king. All right, he's the king of the southern kingdom, Judah. Then, and he did all that when he was younger. Come a stage where he was dying. All right, he was in old age and he was dying. And in his dying bed, he cried out to God, God, save me. And the Lord answered his prayer. 
the Lord gave him extension of life. Alright, so can you imagine he was dying and God supernaturally zapped him. He was healed. Alright, and then when the people heard about it. Uh, people from Babylon heard about it. They came to visit him. And you know what he did immediately? Alright, when people, he was miraculously healed by God and, and people came to, to visit him to send best wishes and this is what he did. He bring them to the treasury of, the, uh, of Judah. Show off all the wealth of the nation. And as a result, Isaiah was sent by God to pronounce judgment to him. Isaiah 39 tells us this. Uh, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that's in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons will issue from you and will be, that whom you will beget will be taken away. They will become officials or they will become slaves in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good because in his mind there will be peace and truth in my time. All right, let me paraphrase this in Singapore context. I imagine there's a king in Singapore and the prophet went to the king and says that, King, listen, all right, the day will come when everything that you, you have, your sovereign fund in Tamase, your sovereign fund in GIC, everything that you have will be sapu and go to JB. <laughs> and then the king will say this, Heng ah, bo wai tai ji. None of my business because it only happened after I die. What do you call people like that? Selfish. That's why in 2 Chronicles, God made a judgment about Hezekiah. Right now, another thing that I thought was very interesting, can you imagine with me for a while, uh, you are miraculously healed of cancer. Or, or I be, uh, so you're, you're miraculously healed of cancer. And someone came to visit you. And you open the door and you immediately you bring them to your kitchen, you open up your fridge and show off all your abalone, your shark fin, your what have not. That's exactly what he did. What would you have done if you are miraculously healed? and someone come to visit you, what would you have done? You would give thanks to God. God healed me. God did something in my life. I, a Judah will depend on no one else but Jehovah God. That would be what he would have done. But he did not do that. You know why? Because at that time, there was war going on. Babylon and Egypt and Assyrian, they were fighting. He felt the need to show off that Judah is of a certain standing. We have the resources. We are able to fight. Meaning to say this, subtly, where is his idol? The resources. And not only that, he also feels like there's a way to, to help to see, let Babylon know that they can be human alliance. They can be partners together all right, so that Egypt cannot attack us. His confidence is in the human relationship. Can you see the, the secret idols of the heart? Now, because of the secret idols of the heart, all right, immediately after, uh, sorry, after Hezekiah died, 100 years later, 586, Babylon came and totally destroyed Jerusalem. All right? The country paid a heavy price because the king was not consistent with God, because the king has idols in his heart. I'm saying this to us to warn us that there are consequences when the, that our walk with God is not consistent. All right? And this is what I like to say to all of us here. Check our hearts today. Are there any idols in our hearts? It's easy to tell the Lord, Lord, I will serve you. It's easy to tell the Lord, I will follow you. But it's more important to check our hearts. Are there secret idols? And especially I want to talk to a group of people here. I want to talk to a group of people who are 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old and above. You see, I believe that the greatest wastage in the church today is where we fail to tap on the wisdom, the knowledge, the life of those who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s. All right, because after a while, because the world tells us about retirement and somehow we bring that mindset back to the church. We think that we have served the Lord in our young days. Now is the time for us to pull back and let the young one continue. There's nothing wrong in succession. There's nothing wrong in allowing the new generation to rise up. But to, to think in our head, it's time to retire spiritually, is, a, is, is not, it's an ungodly thought. 
It's never from God. I want to say to the word, I want to express my heart to those of you who are 50, 60, and 70, and God bless you if you're 80. I want to encourage us, may we be like the Caleb of old, to dare ask God for a new mountain to conquer for the glory of God. That may we live our life consistently all the way until we graduate into eternity. Don't settle for anything less. It is never God's will for us to slow down spiritually. There's no such vocabulary before God. God wants all of us to finish well. And we need to walk consistently with God all the days of our life. I look at Brother Jeff. He's truly a legend. Even in his holiday, he witnessed to people. Conduct some something to people in the cruise and all that. By all means, go for your cruise, go and play your golf and all that. But never compromise in our service to God. I want to say a quick word to those of you who are younger, those of you who are 50 years old and below, the 20, the 30, and the 40s. Forgive us if we have been inconsistent. But for your own generation, may you be consistent in your walk with God. Never give up the Lord. Never allow your heart to be compromised by idols. This is the heart of God for us. Right? In order for you and I to finish well, all of us must walk consistently with God. How can you and I finish well? We can only finish well if our Decision to follow the Lord. Our cho- when we choose to, follow, to serve the Lord, our choice must be complete. Fear God, serve God, no other gods. And not only that, it is, must be complete, it must be expressed out consistently. All right? That we must follow the Lord all the days of our life. All right? And then we must guard against idols in our hearts. And not only that, we must finally, whatever we say, we must carry it out. Whatever we say, our decision, our choice must be expressed with action. Right, Joshua said to the people, your weakness says against yourself that you have chosen for yourself the Lord to serve Him. And they said, we are weaknesses. Then Joshua said, now therefore put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. This is the fourth time Joshua has talked to them. And this is the third time Joshua repeated, remove the foreign gods. Let me show you. All right? I'm just putting the, uh, uh, the, the table so that it's clearer for you to see. All right, verse 14, he tells them, put away the foreign god. And they say, we will serve the Lord. Then he say again, verse 19, put away the foreign god. Do not forsake the foreign god. Then they say, we will serve the Lord. Then he say again at verse 23, put away the foreign god. And they reply, we will serve the Lord. Do you notice the difference? It's, put away the foreign god. They say, we will serve the Lord. Put away the foreign god. We will serve the Lord. Basically, they did not answer Joshua at all. They did not commit themselves. They said they will follow the Lord, but they did not say that they will remove the foreign gods. Right until 24, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey His voice. Now this part, we will obey His voice, so muted that Joshua was not satisfied with their answer. All right? Joshua wanted to make sure that they really carried out their decision. They really carried out their choice, all right? And so this is what Caleb, uh, Joshua did, all right? So Joshua made a covenant with them and he made for them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. I'll come back to Shechem later. And, and Joshua wrote this word and took a large stone, all right? And, and put this stone in front of the people and said that this will be a stone, a weakness against you and against us. Basically what he's saying that this stone will be a reminder because you cannot say you decide to serve the Lord and you do nothing. So this is a stone to remind us that we must serve the Lord and put away the idols in our life. All right, so this is what Joshua was committed to. He wanted to make sure that the people really carried out their choice to follow the Lord, to serve the Lord. Now, let me qualify uh, this, okay? Now, there's a difference between choice or decision against intention. For example, I say I want to do this and I didn't do. Why? Because I only share with you my intention. I have not shared with you my decision. Because every decision, every choice that you make, you will act it out. And if you don't act it out, it is not a choice yet. It is not a decision yet. It is only an intention. So for example, I can tell you, let's assume I'm a non-Christian. I'm a non-Christian and I tell you, okay, uh, give me time, give me time. You know, before I die, right, I will say the sinner's prayer. 
Okay, don't worry, I, 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 I decide already, I will say the sinner's prayer. But before I die, then I do it. Lah. Then I walked out, I cannot bang by a car, then I died. Am I safe? See? The two wise men in front say no. Right? But the correct answer is, God be the judge. Lah. We don't know. Ah. But Romans tells us this. What must we do? Confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. So I can have the best intention. The best of intention does not save us. The best of intention means nothing. Intention can be just daydreaming. It doesn't mean anything. We must act out. We must carry out our decision. Then it is truly a decision. All right? So in order to help the people, Joshua set up this big stone as a reminder. All right? And he set it up at this place called Shechem. Now why Shechem? Right? Shechem is a very interesting place. There are many things to say, but let me just quickly say in three things. First is a place where God first met Abraham or Abraham, all right? And this is where the covenant, the, the promise was given, all right? At is, uh, Genesis 12. Then Jacob met God at Shechem as well, all right? And so he built an altar to God. Joshua 8, remember Joshua put the people one side at Mount Gerizim, one side at Mount Ebal. He was standing right in the middle, right? The middle is called Shechem. All right, so Shechem is a place of encounter, it's a place of reminder. Question, where is Shechem for us in BPTC? This one, huh? Where is our Shechem? Okay, now, what, so what would be a good place to remind us? What would be a good place to encourage us? All right, let me show you this place that is a good place that can be a good encouragement to us and a big good place of reminder. It's called your handphone. All right, yesterday we have a meeting. The chairman said, please, turn, please take out your paper Bible. And he's the only man with the paper Bible. All of us was carrying our handphone and we were looking at our Bible app. All right, so the, our handphone is a good place of reminder. Our handphone is a good place to, to encounter God. Because some of us, we read our Bible there, we get a lot of encouragement from there, right? So we have given you a postcard. All right, this is the same image to remind us to serve the Lord. Now, behind it, there's a Q QR code. I want to encourage us, can we take a, download this picture, make this in our handphone. All right, make this in our wallpaper. Don't worry, you can set this as your wallpaper so that the moment you click, your, your family photo come out again, your girlfriend picture come out again, okay? But set this as a reminder for us. All right, in your, in your, whether it's in your desktop or in your handphone. Set this up as a common uh, picture we have so that we can constantly remind one another to serve the Lord. All right? Something is a reminder for us. All right, so that in, in the cell group, we remind one another again whenever we see this picture that we have chosen to serve the Lord. Now, again, this point, we talk about the fact that it must be carried out. Your decision, your choice to serve the Lord must be carried out. And this is what we like you to aim towards, all right, the corporate goal. All right, senior pastor, God gave you a download to remind us that we need to pray for our family by name, our cell member by name. We need to share the gospel to somebody, bring somebody to the Lord, and finally bring someone to church. Now, you look at these corporate goals. It's not a corporate goals. This is actually a milestone to help us to fulfill the Great Commission, all right, discipleship. All right, so I want to encourage us. This is something that I want to encourage all of us as BBTC. As you make BBTC your church, be plug in, be part of the cell group, be part of the body life. And together, let's serve the Lord. Let me repeat that again. Together, let us serve the Lord. All right, how do we do that? We pray for one another. We pray for our family. As a cell group, as a community, we share the gospel. We bring someone to the Lord and we bring people to BBTC so that the kingdom of God can be expanded. All right, let's serve the Lord together. Nobody say amen. amen. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's make this our family. Let's make BBTC a church that serves the Lord together. And we don't just say, we do it together. All right? I come to the end of my message. How you and I can finish well. We can finish well when we choose to serve the Lord. And, and the decision we make, the choice we make, is one that's complete. All right? Fear God, serve God, no other God. And not only that, we must live it up consistently 
all the days of our life, we must guard against idols. And not only that, our choice must be carried out. We must put legs to our decision. Right? There must be expression of our decision. But as I bring this message to a close, as I study the Bible, right, I, 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 was, uh, I have a very interesting interaction with this guy. I want to share with you this story quickly. Um, I met this guy because uh, I heard that he, he led prayer meeting at NUS, NTU, SMU, and all that. So I, I heard that God is doing wonderful things through him. So I met him. His name is Matthew. So I asked Matthew, Matthew, what, what, what happened? Well, what led you to this decision? So Matthew was sharing with me that, you know, he used to work in Ernst and & Young and uh, he graduated from NUS and he went to Harvard and he had all the necessary paper qualification. And he was doing well in consultancy and he can project for the next five years where the career path will be for him. And when he was just happy being pagan in, in his own word, huh? doing what, whatever he was doing, God called him and told him, go to Vietnam, set up a hotel and serve the poor. All right? He struggled, he dealt with the inner idols in his life, he walked through the journey of brokenness. All right? The story is very long, but let me cut it short for you. So he went through the journey of brokenness until God is completely his, when he is completely belong to the Lord. And when that happened, God began to bring people to give him money. All right? Then he raised enough money to go to Vietnam. He bought this piece of land, beautiful land, all right, behind is a mountain, in front is the crystal clear water. All right, I saw the pictures, wonderful land. All right, he bought that land and he was about to bring in contractor to build the hotel. Then God called him, come back to Singapore. I have something for you to do. But I said, God, cannot. I, I just started. I just bought the land. If I go back now, people will think that I'm a cheat. I'm not trustworthy. People think that I have given up. I'm not faithful in carrying out what you called me to do earlier. And God said this to him, whose voice do you choose to listen? And he, and he said to that, Lord, of course, it's your voice. All right, so he chose to be consistent with God. Now, we're not talking about a, a wild horse that, that go do whatever he wants to do and tell you he has one direct line to God. He doesn't need to listen to anybody. He's not like that, all right? He submitted to his senior pastor. He shared with his mentor. His mentor is an ex-bishop of Singapore. So you're talking about a man who is accountable, all right? So he shared with that. His mentor, his, his senior pastor, both discerned with him and felt that truly is the voice of God. So he came back to Singapore. When he came back to Singapore, someone asked him, are you willing to just facilitate a small prayer meeting? Say, sure, God called me back. Anything God called me to do, I do. So even a small prayer meeting, he go and facilitate. And before you realize, the small prayer meeting grew to 300 people from NUS praying. More than 600 people gathered into you to pray. They pack up the hall in ACSI. People just come for the prayer meeting. So one of the boys... This is an interesting school. Anybody know what's this school? ACS Barker, okay? So he was facilitating a prayer meeting in ACS Barker and, and, and God was there, people was praying and this one 15 years old boy went up to him after the prayer meeting saying that God touched me so much, I want to see a greater revival for Singapore. I want to see revival for ACS if, and if it caused me to die, I'm willing to die. 15 years old. And he said that even if it means that revival will start with R.I., it is okay. You're talking about 15 years old, huh? School rivalry is still something. To me, when I hear this story, revival has come for this 15 years old. But God can use Matthew because Matthew has chosen to serve the Lord completely, consistently, and he carried out whatever God put into his path. All right? So I want to encourage us. You want to finish well, choose to serve the Lord. Now, the Bible, the, I'll bring you back to this same stone stone. Because the book of Joshua, chapter 24, did not end like that. It ended with three barriers. Right? It talks about the burial of Joshua. Joshua died, they buried him. Then, they buried the bones of Joseph. You're talking about a national leader 400 years before jo Joshua. All right? And then, they buried Eliezer, the son of Aaron. Now, Eliezer and Joshua, they're about the same generation. But why Joseph? 
I'd like to share with us two quick observations. First observation, the book of Joshua marked the end of an old chapter. It's the end of an old era. It's God's way to show us that the people of God who has been faithfully following the Lord, they are now at the promised land. It is God's way of telling us that they have finished well. These three people, they have finished well because they have chosen to follow the Lord completely, consistently, and they carried out whatever God called them to do. That's my first observation. My second observation is this. It is God's way of telling us that the old generation have passed. Joshua 24, the main idea in Joshua 24 is Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. It's an important decision. Because as the old generation passes, the new chapter has started. The new generation, what will be the outcome of the new generation depends on your choice today. What do you decide? Who is your God this today will determine the outcome of the new chapter. In the same way, this is the book for Joshua, this is the book of Joshua, is the same for Singapore today. In Singapore, in the recent years, we see the, the burial of three great men for Singapore. First, the founder of the modern Singapore, Pastor uh, Lee Kuan Yew. I don't say Pastor Lee Kuan Yew, no, no. <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew. All right, he's a great man. Of, he's, a, he's a great man. I'm not saying he's a great man, but he's a great man. He's a good man, all right? But he has since passed on. It's a way of telling us an uh, old generation is passing on. Not only that, we also saw the passing of Billy Graham, the man who gave the prophetic word about the destiny of Singapore, that Singapore will be the Antioch of Asia. He too had passed on. And then the most recently, the passing of Pastor Rick Seward. When you Google Pastor Rick Seward, the thing that the, the website will describe him is that he's the first mega church pastor in Singapore. But he's more than that. Pastor Rick Seward is one of the few men in Singapore that can connect the different streams of Christianity in Singapore. He's one of the few person, few pastor that can connect the charismatic with the evangelical. He's one of the few pastors that have the gravitas where people will come alongside with him because of his life. And you saw the passing of this great man. It's God's way of telling us, church, Singapore is, the, the old Singapore is passing on. A new Singapore is coming. We know politically within the next two, three years, there will be political changes. There will be political leadership change, right? leadership succession. We also know for the next five years, all the mega churches will be going through leadership succession as well. We are standing on a very important threshold. And BBTC, we are alerted to this, and that's why for the coming July, we're calling for a solemn assembly. We're going to call every one of us to come to spend 39 nights, right? 40 days of prayer, but we will be having prayer meeting for 39 nights. I want to ask all of us in BBTC, let's come and pray for the destiny of Singapore, for the future of Singapore, because the future of Singapore will depend on the decision that you are making tonight. Not tonight, today. Your decision will determine the future of Singapore. Our decision as BPTC will shape the future as well. So I encourage us, even as I bring this service to a close, God has been good to us. Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Can I invite us to close our eyes, bow our head and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart today? It's not just, yes, I decided, but we have to decide for all the days of my life, I will follow the Lord. I will serve the Lord. We all eyes closed, all head bow. This is a family time and I want to encourage us in your heart of hearts, make a decisive decision that I will serve the Lord all the days of my life. And specifically for us BPTC, that from today onwards, that you will, I want to encourage us to commit yourself 
to pray for your cell group, pray for your family. Be committed to reach out to somebody and bring somebody to the kingdom of God.